All right, it is five o'clock on Monday, November the 18th. Um, I'm gonna call this meeting to order. The BEDC board reserves the right to reconvene, recess, or realign the regular session, or call executive session or order of business at any time prior to adjournment. So, we are now in order uh, number two. We'll need to welcome our new directors here, TJ Finn, Gary Blake, and Chris McCool. Thank you guys for volunteering to be on this board and being on it. We welcome you, and I know y'all are gonna have a lot of fun. We've got a lot of exciting things going on here. And we also want to thank the former board members, uh, Connie Schrader and Amberly Palmer for their service. Uh, you guys, we're gonna miss you. You guys did a great job, so thank you very much uh, for that. And uh, Sylvia, we're going to go ahead and do number 2B since Roscoe is not here. I was going to move that. Huh? Are they? Are, are both of them here? I mean, are all of them here? Yeah, if you don't mind, I want to go ahead and move the Roscoe one up so they don't have to wait for all the training. And that's going to be just a few minutes here. That would be 6A that we're going to move up real quick. If they're not, we can go ahead and, and continue on. <laughs> He's like, what is he doing, that crazy guy up there? Okay. <laughs> Th thank you, Rick. We're changing things up a little bit here. I didn't want you guys to wait through going all of our training stuff before we, you know, you don't need to sit here and listen to all that. I mean, it's, it's great, but, <laughs> you know. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna move up uh, uh, 6A. It's a presentation from Roscoe Bank for the donation of funds to the BEDC in the amount of $20,000. And just for the, the new directors here, Roscoe Bank was uh, very generous in giving us a total of $100,000 to be given over five years or $20,000 per year. And uh, it is for uh, business expansion, business retention, primarily for small businesses. And it's just been a wonderful thing. We've already had, you know, already used one of them and we're out to go get more folks to sign up for this. So we really thank you for that. You bet, thank you, Ron. I appreciate the opportunity just to say thank you for what you do and, and for contributing to our community in the way that, uh, that you do through this uh, effort uh, with Bastrop Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we're pleased to join with you in that effort with our contribution. Uh, we did pledge $100,000 to the BEDC for the purpose of establishing a revolving loan fund or grant program as you saw fit. Uh, we believe that uh, this is a way for us to demonstrate our commitment to the community on a long-term basis. It, we also believe that it's a way for us to be wise stewards of what we've been given responsibility for. And I can think of no greater way than to show our stewardship over what we have than to increase our generosity as our business increases. So we have today the third installment of five, $20,000 per year for five years. As you, as you noted, um, we're very excited about the opportunity to invest in our community this way and look forward to working with you as we continue to put these funds to good use. So with, with that. <clears throat> I took the liberty of asking Colin to take a picture of everybody yeah. receiving the check. I th we don't have a a picture of the complete board, so I thought this would be, you know, a good photo op. Angela, Angela said bring the big check, so I brought the big check. <laughs> yeah. We'll let the board, we'll let, we'll let you guys over, right? Three or four? Three or five? Three or five? Five? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, you bet, you bet. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, ma'am. Just say that change the date for All right, well, thank you very much there for giving us the opportunity to, to move that one up. We'll move on to 2B. Uh, the BEDC board will have a short recess for reception for outgoing members. Uh, Sylvia? Thank you, Chair. My, my microphone's on a little bit of a shorter leash today. Uh, the, um, the staff has uh, brought a cake to... Um, celebrate with Connie and Amberly, although I understand Amberly is not able to join us tonight. And so it is a token of our appreciation for your service and time on the board. Right, you. You're, you're officially breaking it. Uh, <laughs> a short recess. It is now 5.07. We'll be taking a short recess. It is 5.22. We're going to go ahead and reconvene back uh, in the meeting here. So we will now move to well, number three, public comments. Do we have any public comments at this time? No, sir, we do not. Very good. All right. Then we will move on to number four, the workshop and board training. Uh, the BEDC board training by Charlie Zeck, law firm of Denton, Navarro, Rodriguez, Bernal, Santee, and Zeck, PC. There. Is that good? Okay, that works. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> No, no, it's all right. <clears throat> no, I, uh, I'm happy to, but um, I want to see the theatrical. Oh, were you at the were you at the presentation on Thursday? Yeah, I won't cuss here. <laughs> how, how many y'all were present at my presentation at the EDC? Just, me. Just you. Ah, okay. But, you know, those things can be boring, so I tend to. I thought I was going to fall off at least once. <laughs> okay, that's good. So this is, this is a very high-level presentation, all right? This is not intended to give new uh, board members, directors, or currently existing board members or directors who have been here a while a detailed understanding of the of the of the authority and what the statute says. It's really a broad, a broad overview of, um, of a type B economic development corporation. So the first thing is, uh, does everybody here know how to go find the Texas Local Government Code online? It is available online. You just Google Texas legislature, it pops up, you click on it. There's a link for statutes, you click on it, and all the codes of the te Texas codes come up and you can find the Texas Local Government Code. The authority for type B economic development corporations, all economic development corporations um, that are, that are, oh, and it's gone, uh, that are, uh, that it can be, that can be um, created under state statute are found in chapter 501, chapter 502, chapter 504, and chapter 505 of the Texas Local Government Code. Chapter 501, um, 
actually, it, even though it states provisions governing development corporations, um, it contemplates a variety of other different types of development corporations, but it's also applicable to both type A and type B economic development corporations. So 501 and 502 essentially are general provisions that are applicable to both type A and type B corporations. It's, why you're, it's where you find your general, general authority. 504 and is applicable specifically to a type A corporation, and 505 is applicable generally to a type B corporation. And so where you will, so as a type B corporation, because you have authority to do projects as projects for type B and type A corporations, you'll, you will essentially look at all of these statutory provisions for purposes of authority. Next slide. Or not. No, I understand. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not yeah, yeah. No, it's. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're uh, doing a better job than I am. So thank you. Uh, the other authority that we have to look to that most people don't recognize and realize is uh, the Texas Business Organizations Code. There's a provision in the statute, um, Section 501.054, that says where there are gaps uh, in the local government code, 501, 502, 504, and 505. We look to the Nonprofit Corporations Act, and so long as those provisions are not inconsistent with the local government provisions, the Texas Business Organizations Code, Chapter 22, is applicable. So that's the other code that we would look at for purposes of how we operate um, a Type B Economic Development Corporation. Next slide. There are some reporting requirements. I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, it says that the board is required to complete these uh, reporting requirements, but essentially staff does those on your behalf. Will we get a copy of this slideshow? Uh, we can, yes, Angela, can you make sure that they get a copy of this slideshow, yes, please? Perfect, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, if you want to see the entire slideshow, this is a really condensed version of the slideshow that I did for the, the TML conference. And I think that that's going to be available on their website. I'm not sure. Um, or I can provide you a copy of it if you want to see it. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so for a type B corporation, uh, the board obviously, maybe not obviously, the board serves at the will and pleasure of city council. Uh, that means that board members can be removed for any reason whatsoever. There's no property right in a board in a board position, so they can be removed. You can be removed for almost any reason, um, and I say that because uh, for a lot of council members are familiar with zoning boards of adjustment, and of course zoning boards of adjustment, they are, you can only remove those board members for cause. Um, so this is just like any other committee or commission, which is generally set up by cities. The board members are appointed and removed at the will and the pleasure of the city council. The gov uh, I'll go back. Thank you. Uh, so the, the governing body appoints a seven-member board for two-year terms, and three of the seven members cannot be employees, officers, or members of the city's governing body, which means four obviously can. They can be an employee of the city, they can be an officer of the city, or they can be a member of the city's governing, governing body. This is opposed to a type A corporation, which can have which, which must have a minimum of five members and a term not to exceed six years. So the flexibility given in type A corporation is not given in a type B corporation. It is set. Two-year terms, seven board members, appointed by the governing body. Next slide. So in the code, you'll see that it talks about the authorizing unit. The authorizing unit is the entity that is responsible for and re uh, um, creating the Economic Development Corporation. In our case, that's the City Council. And under the Texas Local Government Code, 501-051, uh, the City Council authorizes the creation of the corporation. Under 056, they approve the certificate of formation. Remember, this is a separate corporation set up under the Texas Nonprofit Corporations Act, so it has to have a filed certificate of formation like any other uh, non Texas nonprofit corporation. Under 062, as we've already discussed, they appoint the board of directors. They, the council approves the bylaws. And under 07, uh, not and, also under 073, 
the council approves all programs and expenditures of the corporation and should and is required to annually review any financial statements and is entitled to access to the corporate books and records so they approve your expenditures they approve your programs they approve and they have access to your books and they um, are, are they should annually review um, your financial statements Finally, under uh, 501007, a municipality, a city, may not lend its credit or grant public money or other thing of value in aid of, that says off, huh, the corporation except under a contract authorized under Texas Local Government Code. What that, uh, 380, so under Chapter 380 of Texas Local Government Code, what that means is that the city cannot give anything to the corporation for free. So any services that the city provides, any resources that are utilized by the corporation, the use of these council chambers as an example, the EDC must reimburse the city the, those, those costs, all right? Nothing, nothing of value. Um, can't lend its credit or grant public money or anything of value. Um, you can for free if it's under Chapter 380, I've done that and we've done that in certain situations, but as far as services provided, they have to be paid for. Next slide. So I'm gonna, this is a high level view of uh, what a type A sales tax can be used for and a type B corporation can also use the type B sales tax in the same manner as a type A corporation. So um, under the code, essentially type A sales tax is very limited with respect to how can you can use type A corporation dollars. Um, it's, there's a list of things there, buildings, equipment, expenditures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for the creation or retention of primary jobs, now you're gonna ask me what's a primary job. If you go to chapter 501, there's an NAICS sector listing in chapter 501 and the primary job has to fall within one of those NAICS sector listings. And so you just go to that list, you look and see, does it fall within the list? And that's gonna be, a, that would then be a primary job. And found by the board of directors to be required or suitable for the development, retention, or expansion of this entire list of things. Now, if you were only a type A corporation, there's four things up here that I believe are like, D, E, F, and G that you can't actually do if you're a type A corporation, but because you're a type B corporation, you don't have that same um, limiting factor. And I'm not gonna read this stuff to you all. Next uh, slide. Important point. A corporation may not provide a direct incentive or make an expenditure on behalf of a business enterprise as a, under a project and you can only spend money on projects, there's a few minor exceptions, promotional costs, administrative expenses, those things, but for purposes of, of the, the economic development part, it has to be an authorized project um, without a performance agreement. Note that it says business enterprise. So the city is not a business enterprise. Should uh, the city uh, request utilizations of type B corporation funds for an authorized project under the code, a performance agreement is not required. The city does not have to create jobs or capital infrastructure, and I'll go into what's required to be in a performance agreement. Um, I all, I, although I do highly recommend, um, to the point of almost insistence, that there be a formal agreement between the city and the corporation so that everybody knows and understands what the parameters are for purposes of how much money is gonna be provided, what it's gonna be used for, how it's gonna be paid out. So there's no confusion, there's no fight, it's all black and white. Next slide. So um, if you are gonna give a direct incentive or otherwise incentivize a business enterprise, um, you have to enter into that performance agreement and that performance agreement must provide for a schedule of additional payroll or jobs to be created and capital improvements to be made um, and um, then specify the terms under which repayment must be made. Those, that has to be in the performance agreement. And so we want to incentivize a, uh, in some sort of uh, company to locate 
within the jurisdictional limits and they want some incentives to do that, there has to be either creation of jobs or capital improvements made. Um, I and I think many other lawyers who represent economic development corporations and cities have taken the position that you don't have to have both. You can create zero jobs so long as you have capital improvements. You can create zero capital improvements so long as you have some job creation. Um, there's no case law interpreting this, but that's how I've interpreted it for the last 20 some years and have not been challenged yet. Um, and then a corporation may spend tax revenues received um, for training offered through a business enterprise only if the business enterprise has committed in writing to do those things, create new jobs and increase its payroll. This comes up oftentimes, it's actually come up on this board, how can we use funds for, for job training? This is how you can do it, right? And it's typically, it's with a business specifically where you're paying the business to do the training for their employees and they agree to those, do those things to get the dollars to pay for that training. Next slide. The only project that does not, well that's not true, the career center projects outside of a junior college district. So there's two provisions, additional projects that do not require primary job creation. The first is um, infrastructure projects. And that's those things that are listed there, streets, water, sewer, telecommunications, internet, and then for those on the beach near the Gulf of Mexico, beach remediation along the Gulf of Mexico. Doesn't apply to us, obviously. And though those projects don't require primary job creation. And so if the example I like to give is if you are um, trying to revitalize your downtown area and the streets are a mess, and uh, I'll, you wouldn't believe this, but this is an actual example. Well, maybe you would believe it if you've been there. Wimberley, for the longest time, the entire downtown was on septic. They didn't have any wastewater uh, in downtown. Now, they didn't use Type B Corporation dollars to put wastewater downtown because they didn't have a Type B Corporation. But had they had a Type B Corporation that generated that sales tax, they could have used those dollars to put the infrastructure in downtown to promote newer expanded business enterprises. They actually put a wastewater line downtown, but they, they did it through general fund dollars. And then finally, uh, again, the, another additional project that can be done is um, listed there, you know, land buildings, expenditures, et cetera, et cetera, um, required or suitable for a career center. Um, if, um, the area to be benefited by the career center is not located in the taxing jurisdiction of a junior college district. And of course a career center has a very specific you know, definition and, and uh, associated with it. Next. So that's type B, A sales tax project dollars. That's gonna be found in 501 and 504 of the local government code. 505 is where you're going to find the revenue uses for type B sales tax. Now where type A general, uh, type A sales taxes are fairly limited, not fairly, but I think very restricted in, with respect to their use, primary, essentially prob, primary job creation within a particular sector, unless it's a career center, unless it's infrastructure. Type B's much broader uh, with respect to the use of those sales tax dollars. Um, and it, that is found in 505 of the local government code. So projects related to recreational or community facilities. And if you read 505.152, it's a pretty long paragraph and it lists a pretty broad spectrum of things that you can do, including open space improvements, things in parks, for example. Um, um, I have clients who utilize type B sales tax dollars to improve their parks. Yeah, they just decided quality of life is important to attract um, businesses that they would like to retain in the community because when businesses come located in a community, what do they want for their employees? They want quality of life for their employees. So they've, they found that if they didn't have the right infrastructure, it was a good use of their dollars. All policy related, obviously. Also projects related to affordable housing in 505-153. Projects related to water supply facilities and water conservation programs in 505-154 and then projects related to business enterprises that create or retain primary jobs. It's a little more specific than the type A. And then finally, the small cities. And that's the one that the city of Bastrop, Econo type A Economic Development Corporation can utilize. 
Uh, so long as you're under 20,000 in population, you can utilize type B sales tax dollars for a list of things, land, building, expenditures, blah, 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 that promote new or expanded business enterprises. So the board would have to find that whatever the expenditure does, it promotes new or expanded business enterprises, and you can use those dollars. That is a very broad use of dollars that, uh, for a type B corporation, um, that allows you to get outside the box on occasion to determine how do you want to use those dollars, so long as it promotes new or expanded business enterprises. Uh, that was actually something that all cities could use for a period of time. When I first started doing this 20 some years ago, any city could utilize that. Uh, then it got abused apparently because the legislature took it away. They removed it from the statute and then later they added it back in for small cities. It, so that's how that played out. I say that uh, only to say, be, let's be careful how we use these dollars. The legislature, I believe it is, watching and, and so they have taken things away in the past. Um, next slide. So what's our macro picture uh, when we're talking about um, economic development corporations generally? Uh, next, next slide. First, the macro picture is the city council goals. And city council has multiple goals, right? City council has, you know, they want to fight police services, fire services, public, so public safety, um, regulatory issues not associated with economic development, make sure people's toilets are flushing, make sure they're getting their water. They've got, bro you know, this broad spectrum of, of, of um, interests and goals that they're looking for, one of which is economic development, right? And of course, cities have broader authority with economic development. They've got Chapter 380, the local government code, which doesn't place any, it, it places restrictions, but it's pretty, pretty broad authority under Chapter 380. Next is the EDC goals. The EDC goals is economic development. Now, having said that, in my broader conversations and that I, when I give presentations, those, those economic development goals for the city and the EDC, they need to align. Okay, Be because if you remember back at the beginning of my presentation, the city council approves the projects, it says programs, but they approve the programs, they approve the expenditures, they appoint the board, they do all of those things. So it needs to align, dear client, because you know what happens if it doesn't, they figure out a way for it to align. Sometimes there's not the political wherewithal to do it, but eventually they figure out a way for it to align. So those, those two things plus, next slide, the law, those are the macro pictures that we're looking at. We need to make sure that the council goals, the EDC goals, and the law all come together in the right picture so that we get the micro picture, next slide, of alignment. So that we do all of those things, the EDC goals, the city council goals, they, and make sure that that is in alignment, that is that we also comply with the law, we put that together, we've got this lovely Venn diagram that shows when all those things come together on a micro level appropriately, that little center section, that's the job of the EDC. And I think that's my last slide, yes. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And I'd like to note for you that I did not cuss once <laughs> during this presentation. <laughs> Well, I'd just like to add also to the new directors that we currently have a, a I guess you would call it an agreement. I wouldn't say a performance agreement. But it's a, a services a, agreement. A services agreement with the city uh, that we uh, review occasionally, but we've uh, made some really good changes over the last, since Sylvia came on, and it's been working quite well. So we do comply with everything that's been shown by, by Charlie, and uh, like I said, it's uh, been working quite well for the last several years. You want, to, you want to let them know what that shared services agreement covers? So um, we process payroll, um, and so between payroll and HR, um, we process um, financial transactions. So when there's a check written, that goes through the city's financial process. Angela generates. It requires a second signatory. All of the checks and balances on, um, on the accounting side are handled. So. Yes. Software. All the benefits, all the software. I missed the word benefit with payroll. <laughs> yes. Okay, very good. Any, any further questions? 
And I'm always available, obviously, to answer any questions you may have. I'm curious about the sales tax A, B. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that whatever funds that we have, we have those in separate accounts so we know what came from sales tax A and B, or am I confused? No, I was, no, you're not confused. I didn't communicate appropriately how it works. Um, so there are two different types of corporations. There's a type A economic development corporation and a type B economic development corporation. Each of those is cre can, be, can be created by a community. You can either create a type A or you can create a type B. If you create a type A, you're limited to only that use that a type A sale, that a type A corporation can do. If you create a type B, it's not divided between a type A sales tax and a type B sales tax. It's one type B sales tax. But there's a provision in 505 that says a type B corporation can do any, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, any type A project. Okay, so we, it's... It's well, one sales one tax so, okay. that can be used for any broad set of projects within both. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. No, 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 it's okay. I learned something every new about how I communicate and whether or not it's clear or not. I'm just happy it wasn't a dumb question. It was not a dumb question. <laughs> there are no dumb questions. That's there right. No Okay, uh, we will move on then to section five, uh, the director's report, uh, 5A, the introduction of Dory Kelly, the business attraction, retention, and expansion director. Hi, Dory, do you wanna make your way up? I'm sure you've all met Dory. Uh, Dory's been with us, I guess it's been about three weeks now, although it feels a little bit more like three months. She's managed to make her way around town meet all of our folks um, and also really if you have not i know charlie's already feeling uh, some of the pinch and i know roscoe bank who just left is already feeling the pinch if you've not dealt with her she's a force to be reckoned with she follows up and follows up and follows up it's so wonderful. your phones might be burning up <laughs> no it's wonderful it's it is great. it's wonderful yeah. it's wonderful so dory good evening directors i've enjoyed getting to know y'all over the last couple weeks i've been here now three weeks and I, um, I'm Dory Kelly, for the record, and I am honored to be your new business retention, sorry, attraction, retention, and expansion manager for the Bastrop Economic Development Corporation. I've long admired the city of Bastrop, and I'm so happy to be a part of this amazing community. I look forward to working under your leadership and implementing all of your initiatives and goals that will continue driving economic success here in the city of Bastrop. Thank you. Well, thank you and welcome <laughs> aboard, and we're glad that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Dory. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on to 5B update on joint meeting with the City Council on December the 3rd, 2024. Um, so, uh, Chair, as you're aware, maybe other members of the board aren't aware, Hunden will do their preliminary presentation to uh, this board and then we will move forward with the joint meeting of the EDC and the council board to further refine whatever's presented today again part of that Venn diagram that Charlie loves to show <laughs> is that we are in absolute collaboration and lockstep so the meeting on the third will solidify some of that and we'll make some determinations on that point uh, at that point as to whether we continue or make any additional modifications or send Hunden back perhaps to the drawing board That will also be an opportunity to have uh, council, I, I suspect the EDC will approve a bid uh, tonight that's in your packet. On the third, council can approve that bid as well. Any questions? Okay, moving along. Uh, 5C, update on the Bastrop Regional Business Summit that took place November the 13th, 2024 at the Bastrop Convention Center. So the Regional Business Summit is a pretty new venture. The Chamber uh, is the one who led the session. Um, Bastrop EDC was a title sponsor. We contributed $10,000 to that event. Um, it included a round table with uh, X, a person from Twitter, previously known as Twitter, now X. Uh, the movie studio, um, some folks from Pearl River, Sendero, and um, who was the other person? Thank her. Yes, yes, uh, residential development. 
um, the Hunt Group, who's developing the colony. Um, I opened with a um, similar presentation to State of the City, Where Are Things Today? And that roundtable was really about why Bastrop. And it's very interesting to hear why the company selected Bastrop. And really, it is our demographic. It's our accessibility to Austin. It is our educated population. And it is our, um, also, we're central to Austin, Houston, and everything in between. So things are going to continue to grow. The colony uh, announced 5,000 additional homes in its uh, area, along with the other homes that we have exactly in that periphery. So the, um, the mission to attract workforce uh, hopefully is embedded in some of that housing discussion as well. And um, it's important that we continue lockstep with the school. They all talked about employees. They all talked about training programs. So um, that's a relationship we need to continue to foster. Any questions? OK, thank you very much, Sylvia. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, uh, we're moving on to regular business and presentations. We've already done 6A, which was the presentation of the Roscoe Bank. So now we will move on to the presentation by Hunden Partners about the Sports Complex Feasibility Study. So Hunden is time certain at 6 o'clock, so we can, um, if we can move to approving the minutes and then move to your election, we can skip back to Hunden. That's what we'll do then. Okay, so uh, 6C, approval of the meeting minutes for regular BEDC board meeting of September 25th, 2024. Looking for a motion to approve. A motion to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those don't want it? Okay. <laughs> the ayes have it. Very good. Okay. Uh, we're moving on to 6D. Uh, consideration, discussion, and possible action on the election of the fiscal year 2024 and 2025 BEDC officers of Chair, Vice Chair, Secretary, Treasury. Uh, I motion to uh, approve Ron Spencer as Board Chair. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those not in favor? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to make a motion then that uh, we keep um, Frank uh, as the Secretary, Treasurer, and we uh, have uh, Gary Blake as the vice chair. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All Sorry. those that don't? Okay, the ayes have it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we can go ahead and move on to 6E, the consideration, discussion, and possible action on schedule for the upcoming board meetings, including date and time of meetings. So, uh, Chair Spencer, our board, this is something we've become in the habit of doing every time we have new board members appointed. Because maybe Mondays at 5 o'clock just simply does not work for somebody. So this is a perfect opportunity for you all to discuss amongst yourselves. Does 5 o'clock on the third Monday, except for holidays, <laughs> work for everybody? And on your staff uh, report, there should be a list of what I'm proposing as the third Monday, except for holidays. Is it on the screen? Yeah, she's good. She put it on the screen. Um, if anybody can't make this, these dates slash times, now's a good time to say, hey, this is not going to work. Thank you. Motion. You need a motion. Motion. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Okay, the ayes have. Thank you very much. Yeah, that really works well. Five o'clock Monday. Good question. Uh, let's see. We can move to the bids if, uh, if that's. Yeah, let's go ahead and, and do that since we have, we're moving along quickly. <coughs> so the uh, item before you, let's see. Well, nope, there's a resolution on suspending the sale. Do you want to do this after the. Uh, after the presentation by Hunden? That uh, probably makes sense. Yeah, let's do it. <coughs> okay. Oh. oh, there were some bids in well, here. Let's see. Yeah, let's go to 6G, which is consideration of possible action on the resolution R2024 0011, approving the bids for the completion of the renovations of City Hall for the 
So, um, Mayor, in, I'm sorry, Chair, in your packet are uh, three bids. I had them up on the screen, but somehow it's blank. Um, Moab Construction came in as the low bidder at 84,449. Home and Hand Design came in as the second at 84,900. And Segura Interiors came in at 91,500. Um, city staff, uh, Doug Haggerty is here with our Fleet and Facilities Department if you have any questions. Moab uh, is the lowest bidder and is also somebody that um, staff is familiar with and has managed to bring their projects in uh, on time and on budget. So that is who staff is uh, recommending. It is a build out of three offices and a conference space where the prior utilities business office was located. Uh, can you give us a little more details as far as when they can start and about how long it would take to, to complete the, uh, the construction? Please. So it, it's not, uh, we're not moving any major walls or anything like that. There is a little bit of a build out that's um, important. What I explained, and I'll let Doug finish, what I had explained to Angela and uh, Dory is that we do have two vacant offices if staff needs to move over in the interim. Um, they're finishing their inventory to see what uh, actual documents and paperwork they're going to bring with them. They've been undergoing, you approved a part-time person to go through the scanning. They've been undergoing a, a, an extensive scanning exercise to reduce the amount of paper that comes uh, their way. So I believe no matter what, we'll need an off-site storage unit. And so, um, because they're not done in their, in their scanning project. But in the short term, there is office space available here should they need to vacate. Angela's already also talked to the landlord about a possible month-to-month -month extension, if that is also something the board desires. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so as far as timeline goes, um, we are ready to start on that project uh, once we get approval from all you guys. Uh, what it looks like is that the um, uh, MOAB, if that's who you all choose, um, are ready to uh, basically start, you know, probably Probably next week. We'll have a contract. We'll go over that. We'll review it, get it out to you guys, make sure you um, approve of what their terms are and what everything looks like. Um, we'll get final sign off, and then from there, um, you know, we'll uh, be able to jump in and start taking on that, that project. 30 days, 45 days, what are we looking at? Yeah. Um, they'll shoot for the end of the year. Um, with the timeline being condensed, it's already the 18th, so might get in there by December 1st. And so, holidays and things like that, um, it might be tight to get everything done, but I think that they will still do their best to uh, try and meet that deadline. So, I mean, realistically, I've, several of us have been in construction, so realistically, it's not going to be the end of the year. It's going to be probably, what, the second week of January, you think, it really? Could be, yeah. Yeah. It's not super, it's, they're not, um, so there's a demising wall that has to come out. It's not a load bearing. Um, we reconfigured the office spaces so that everybody has a window. So there won't be any major uh, demolition. It's mostly construction. The, the biggest demolition that's coming out is the glass frame. Uh, and that's to create some of the office space. But there's uh, not really a whole lot of load bearing stuff that's happening. They're going to pull that uh, drawer that's there by the... They're going to uh, false frame They're it. going to fall. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. And board, I would like to point out there has been um, a couple of changes to the resolution that is in your packet. We did add Moab construction to it as well as the amount just to memorialize that in the resolution. Charlie pointed that out. <laughs> so we fixed it. Just know that what you signed, Ron and Frank, it's going to be a little different from what's in your packet. My only question is, because I noticed uh, the information that's in the packet, have we has the city done business with Moab before? Is that what you were saying? Yes, they did the utility business office conversion. So the utility business office moved to the bank next to the post office, uh, and that's gotcha. who did that construction. Yeah, because they were all really close. And yeah, and another right. project that they worked on uh, was actually for the uh, Bastrop Visitor Center and Museum, the uh, reception desk. Uh, they worked on that for us as well. Perfect. Thank you. Resolution here. In the Sorry. Do you have the resolution here in the packet? Uh, it should be in the packet. I don't have it pulled up on my screen, but I can find you the page number. Just a moment. 
If not, we can, she can amend it and you can, um, she can send it out for digital signature. It still has to go to the city. No, I, I know. I just wanted to go ahead and yeah. if we can approve it. Okay, so I guess I'm looking for a motion to approve resolution number R-2024-0011. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. All, right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Very good. Okay, the resolution is passed. So basically what you said, Sylvia, is that now uh, next Tuesday or tomorrow we can go to city? Yes. Council for that? Okay. Yes, we have a, at your joint EDC meeting on the 3rd, it can go at that meeting. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Actually, okay. I, I still have time to amend the 630 agenda for Thursday. I could potentially put it on for Thursday. Well, it might, it might give them another couple of days head start if that's something y'all feel you could. Uh, you Mr. Could Zach, <laughs> if I get the resolution drafted ASAP and get it to you tomorrow, do you think you could have it approved Absolutely. and back to us? Yes. Does it need just one reading? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Yep. All right. Very good. Okay. So it's six oh one now. Do you think we're ready for yes. London? Yes. So Colin or CC, can you pull up the go to meeting, please? Thank you. Okay, uh, we've come to the point now for um, uh, some updated information from you guys, and we're very interested to hear what you have to tell us. Wonderful. Can you can you all hear us? Yes, we can. Thank you. Wonderful, Greg. Did you want to set the stage for anything or give any updates before we get into it? Um. I don't know if I've got any major updates. I'll kind of let you take that, Ryan, but uh, the team has been heavily at work. We've been looking at the site. We met with the Kimley team. I know you guys have been talking to operators and a lot of different folks and gathering information. So um, we'll, we'll hear the updates from the Hunden team today and uh, keep making progress from there. But I'll turn it over to you, Ryan, and your team. Yeah, wonderful. That's perfect. Thank you so much. And um, as, as Greg I said, um, we've made quite a bit of progress. I think Emily's going to try and share our chat. Yeah, and I, I apologize. I'm not familiar with this platform, but it won't it won't let me share right now. So could the organizer allow allow that? Yes, we're working. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Um, but just. To give a little bit of an update, we have a slide on this in the deck that we'll go through. But again, just as a reminder, about two weeks from now, we will be meeting again virtually to go over our market findings presentation. That will include our recommendations for what the project should include. And at that point, we will gather any feedback from the team and work through or start working into our demand and financial and economic impact projections. So. Today's mainly a check-in to focus on um, the work that's been done to this point. Um, we've isolated about 20 slides to go through quickly, but um, we've got a lot of content in addition to that. We're shooting for about 80 to 100 slides, but um, again, we're just going to go through a little bit today to give you an update in terms of where we're looking at competitively in the region, um, some interview feedback from some of the major conversations that we've had. Um, and then just some, some work on some case studies that we're gonna do over the next couple of weeks. Um, but other than that, we've made a lot of good progress and really excited to give you a little bit of an update today. But Emily, are, are you having any luck with the sharing? I'm not, I had the, the remote control, but still not able to share the screen yet. Um, if you wanna send it to me, I'll put it up on our screen and you'll just tell me when to advance the screen. Okay. Yeah. Let me. CC's controlling. Let me do that. Okay. Okay. So. 
I'm just going to save it as a PDF so it could send in the email. Or can I send it in the, is there a ch chat in here or should I send it via email? Uh, email. Oh, I think. Okay, let's see. Um. Okay, so it's saying that I can. And I really do apologize. I'm just not familiar with this platform. It's so it's only giving me Chrome or my window. And I could do an uh let me see. It may be easier for me to send it to you because it's only letting me do my Chrome tab instead of like PowerPoint. Yeah, so I'll just, you can just you can just send it over to them. Yeah. And what is the best email? S as in Sam, C as in cat, A as in apple, R, R, I as in igloo, L, L, O, at cityofbastrop.org. I just sent that email to you too, Emily. Thank you. Yep. All right. All right, just sent that. Hopefully it gets over there in, in a second here. I have not received. I'm refreshing my email. You know what I can do too? I just thought of this. I downloaded it to my to my Google account so I can pull it up on Chrome. So let me try again. Yeah, let's see. All right. All right, that should be good, can and then hopefully we can just scroll through it, Emily. I'll just so. scroll through, yeah. And can you all see that all right? Cece, yeah. can you hide their, um, can you hide their faces so we can expand? Thank you. Mm. 
Are we all set? You guys are, are seeing it seeing it all well? Yeah, there we go. That's good. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, yes, thank you again. Sorry about the difficulties. You know, in these next two weeks, one thing that we're really focused on for you all is striking a balance between making uh, these recommendations, um, putting Bastrop on the map in terms of a, a destination for regional activity, but really also taking into account that in order to make a project like this successful, you know, that visitation Monday through Thursday is really important from the local community. And it's really about mixing the two needs of a growing community together with what's the gap in the market to be able to drive regional activity and regional business into the city that can really drive significant economic impact. So that's really what we're focusing on, on finalizing over the next two weeks in terms of recommendations. So um, just a little snapshot of the project status um, as we look um, on this chart, kind of looking at that middle right now for the check-in call here on the 18th. Again, we're, we're going to be doing our preliminary findings presentation on December 3rd and then working through the rest of the year on those demand and financial projections um, and getting the, uh, the scope of work wrapped up in the first or second week of January um, and, and getting all the feedback from year end that we need to work through that. So again, still on track a good position in terms of the research. I'm going to let these guys take over on, on some of the research that we've been doing, but quickly wanted to touch on the site overview. Um, so we've been working with Greg and his team and Kimley Horn on, on understanding um, some of the site challenges that we may have in play and just making sure that we're whittling down the site area and the focus area to developable land. And if we can get in the way of some of these right of ways that have been planned, just making sure that we're staying consistent with the plans of the city and the, the land that we have in play, that we're not going over um, any wetlands or, or just doing more research on what areas that we think we can actually put some, some drawings to in terms of what can be developed. So um, certainly working through that and continuing to make sure that we're conscious of that as we get into it. But um, today we wanted to focus on just showing off some of the research at the local level, the regional level, um, and then just giving a little bit of, of what's more to come in the next two weeks before we get to these recommendations. So Emily, if you want to quickly walk through some of the local market overview and then we can continue on from there. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. And I just want to, to say as well, I hope you guys can see it. I, I can't tell how close you are to the screen. So I hope you guys can see these tables that, we, that we've created and feel free to stop or ask any questions, you know, as we go through some of these slides because um, we're happy to explain what they're showing, um, again, if you have any questions. But just want to highlight some of the local supply, um, those sports facilities that are currently in Bastrop. And when we say local, we're looking within 25 miles, and then Ashton will kind of show facilities that are more regional, so outside 25 miles. Um, so we know that not all these facilities are, are in Bastrop, but within Bastrop in the greater county and just outside the county. Um, and as you all are aware, uh, there are not a whole lot of facilities that are that are large enough to hold tournaments, uh, let alone practices for the local sports teams. So it actually came up in some of our conversations that those outdoor fields for baseball are sometimes being utilized as multi-purpose fields since there's a ton of um, there's not a ton of fields available uh, for practice. Um, and then, as you know, there there are not a whole lot of indoor courts in well, there are no, none in Bastrop outside of the this. Uh, school facilities and then it was it was brought up as well that people are going to Smithville Recreation Center to utilize their courts um, when not able to use the, the local sports or local schools facilities. So just want to give you um, just that overview of those of those local facilities and then you can see as well we have visitation for 2023. So what are how many people are coming to those facilities and then the percent of visits outside of 100 miles this is more more relevant for those regional facilities to really get an idea of that regional pull. Um, so how far people are willing to travel to utilize the facility. Um, but so that's that's the local. I'm going to turn it over to Ashton to kind of go over um, some of the regional facilities mm -hmm. and then he'll turn it back over to me. Yeah, thank you, Emily. As you can see, this table illustrates the 15 most relevant regional facilities uh, in the Austin MSA and expanded beyond that as well, all the way out to Houston, 
not to call it station. So there's nine outdoor complexes and there's six indoor complexes. These were selected based on the range of criteria that saw them as a tournament caliber facility. And it basically allows them to induce uh, those vi visitation from over 100 miles, which generates the economic impact for their relative city. This next slide, which Ryan will speak on, speaks or uh, shows you the outline of the map of where all this. <coughs> Yeah, and I, I think it's just important to focus um, relative to this project, you know, again, talking with a lot of tournament operators and trying to understand what's really that, that competitive market. You know, as we've, as we've had more discussions, it's really focused on the 35 corridor, which is driving a lot of the traffic to these competitive facilities. Um, 35 makes it easy to up, get north and south through the state and is, is really starting to be a hub uh, for a lot of the growth in Texas, obviously, especially between um, Austin and San Antonio, which we see as, as the fastest growing corridor on 35 right now. It's also important to note that the development in, in Austin is really heading east towards Bastrop. Um, and we're looking to capture and kind of marry in what Emily talked about at the local level, knowing that there's a lot of stress on these facilities, um, that there's a high demand for space in the market locally and then understanding how we can siphon some of that demand off from the 35 corridor all the way over to College Station in Houston and, and really becoming a hub that's central to everything within the state to be in within that, uh, that drivable uh, radius. So going through that table that Ashton talked about, you know, really just trying to understand the supply of what's being found within the competitive market in terms of diamonds, fields, indoor courts, to understand where some of this tournament visitation is going across the state and for what kinds of sports. Um, again, have had a lot of good conversations with tournament operators as well as facility operators to understand what kind of those gaps in the market are, what they're seeing they need more demand for, um, both locally and within the region. Um, so if you wanna go back down, Emily, just pass the, the slide with the map. Um, yeah, and, and Ashton, I'll just continue on. You know, one thing that, that we've been looking at, um, especially to putting a little bit more of an emphasis on that utilization uh, during the week from locals is understanding what the, the more popular facilities are um, around the Austin MSA. So we've highlighted a few. We just wanted to show some sample output from some of the profiles that we've put together. So Emily, if you go down to Round Rock, um, it's, it's a project that we're very familiar with. Um, and understanding all of the indoor and outdoor components that are found in Round Rock now. Round Rock is, is certainly a destination and, and got on the trend of sports tourism early, able to um, establish themselves in a phased approach to the development of both their indoor and outdoor facilities. Uh, but one thing that we've learned over time from studying the facility, if, if you go down to the next slide, Emily, um, is looking at, and this, this may be a little bit difficult to see, but in looking at some of the visitation that we have, have pulled and compared in a, a facility that's kind of similar to this in College Station, on the indoor side of things, um, they, they developed six courts there indoors, um, which makes it really difficult for tournament operators to host um, large regional and, and even national events with only six courts. And we do a lot of work with uh, developers of these facilities that typically recommend that in order to draw regional and, and even national competitions, that they wouldn't go below a minimum of eight courts. So when you look at the comparison of long distance visitation in Round Rock versus the one that we're also looking at within the competitive set that's found next on this list, um, that's in College Station that has um, eight courts, even though this facility is relatively newer um, and is still coming into its growth stage in terms of being able to attract um, relevant events, they're having a little bit more success pulling visitation from long distances due to the court counts that are there, uh, much more conducive to being able to uh, draw visitation from longer distances and have some a little bit higher end showcases um, in terms of their operations there. So. Um, we're going to be interviewing the firm that operates this facility on Wednesday to hear a little bit more from their operations and best practices that they've been able to establish in College Station. Hear a little bit more about what they see as a gap in the market in terms of the region on the indoor sports side of things um, and, and really use those takeaways to help really finalize the recommendations for what we're looking at here. So. 
Um, just wanted to give a little bit of a sample for the depth of, of the research that we're doing on some of these facilities within the competitive set to make sure that we're really getting the holistic picture of regional visitation and regional sports tourism. Again, with the ultimate goal of identifying the gap in the market for what's there um, and in what we can recommend for the city of Bastrop. So, um, Emily, we can continue on um, a okay. little bit here um, with the tournament capabilities. And, Emily, I'll let you finish up with some of the interview feedback. But yeah. um, just wanted to bring this up because as, as we've talked with Greg and Kim Lee Horn a little bit of, about the site, looking at a total of, of just under 100 acres of, of developable land. And I just want to bring this back to what we look at when we're trying to understand what the trends are when it comes to developing facilities that have the potential to draw um, regional activity for tourism. And again, which is, which is really the focus of the study. Um, one thing that we just wanted to bring up as we're kind of getting into finalizing these recommendations is understanding that when we interview these tournament operators on the outdoor sports side of things, being cognizant of the number of, of flat fields or sports fields, if, if you think of a, a typical soccer field, or of baseball diamonds that they need at a minimum to host impactful regional events. Um, so on the sports side of, the, or on the, the field side of things, we're looking at anywhere from 12 to 16 fields that need to be, need to be developed to host um, impactful recreational or impactful tourism focused events, so I apologize. And then on the diamond side, looking at a minimum of eight to 12 fields to host some, some of these uh, more impactful regional tournaments. One thing that we've discussed with, with Greg and the Kimley Horn team is just being cognizant of the fact that with under 100 acres to develop, um, in order to develop the, the field counts that would be needed on the outdoor side of things, we'd really be jamming a lot of these assets into the site, which we can get creative for. But in, in the early conversations that we've had on the volleyball and basketball side, um, understanding that on the court side of things, needing a minimum of eight basketball courts or 16 volleyball courts, which typically takes up around 20 acres for an indoor facility. Um, we see a lot of potential on the, on the indoor side of things for having an impactful facility due to the site constraints and the size requirements. So really we're gonna be focused in the next couple of weeks on understanding uh, the, the demand on the indoor side, both locally and regionally, and seeing how we can make outdoor components complementary to an indoor facility, because we really see that as the number one option here um, in terms of being able to drive that, that regional business. So, Emily, if you could just touch on a couple of those interviews and the key feedback that we've got so far um, before we can wrap up and take some questions, that would be great. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. And as, as Ryan mentioned earlier, when, we, when he was setting the stage, we've, we've had a handful of different conversations um, since our, our in-person visit. And, you know, these conversations are crucial because, especially after the, that first visit, because that group setting is great, uh, but really getting those individual perspectives and opinions is also is very helpful, especially uh, with the local stakeholders, you know, living, breathing, Bastrop. So they really understand where, where, where the city's going, that current demand. Um, so we were able to speak with city representatives and or organizations. Um, we've spoken with a few regional sports tournament stakeholders, and I'll, I'll highlight some of the, the conversations in the next slide. Um, and then I have some other relevant stakeholders listed as well. Those facilities in red, those have all been ones that we've, we've reached out to and we've not yet had conversations with, but they're, they're in the process of being scheduled. So, you know, by the time we have that preliminary finding in, uh, I think, two weeks, we hope to have those, those conversations. So just wanted to provide that list here for you all for you all to understand who we've talked to and who we plan to chat with but just want to give um an overview of some of the some of the main takeaways from these conversations and i don't expect you to read all of these bullets word for word right here so i can i'll just summarize um the main takeaways but from the local stakeholders there's high demand for both indoor and outdoor facilities with no indoor courts um, and limited gymnasium access like i mentioned previously when I chatted about the local supply. Uh, many residents travel to nearby cities like Eldon, Smithville, and Austin to access those um, better equipped indoor facilities. And then the area is seeing an influx of restaurants and hotels uh, with two new branded hotels being scheduled to open in 2025, which is 
which is really great to hear when you think of a tournament facility, you know, potentially being built. Um, hopefully with that, there will only be more hotel room nights generated. So having more hotel supply, supply will be a benefit to a, to a um, project like this. And then the local economy is, a bene is benefiting from Elon Musk's presence with those several companies moving to the area um, and contributing to the overall growth, bringing in young professionals and families with um, additional children, which again will only help drive um, demand to a facility like this. We also spoke with youth, the Youth Basketball Association um, and he, he's located just outside of Houston. So with Texas, specifically the Metroplex, um, there's booming demand for basketball facilities, um, but Dallas itself is well supplied, as you all may be aware. Uh, but areas like Houston, Austin, and San Antonio are still underserved um, for those court facilities, um, and there's a lot of growth opportunities within those areas. Uh, the region overall lacks those dedicated sports centers, um, and then again, just the rising demand for basketball teams. And then the demand for quality sports facilities and, and tournaments continues to grow within Texas. And then the USA Volleyball, um, the person that we spoke with is an independent, independent event planner within USA Volleyball. Um, he plans events all over the state um, and they really benchmark for facilities that are about six, six basketball, which is 12 volleyball courts. Uh, many clubs in Texas are owned um, or own their own facility. Um, and they're in typically between that four to eight range, uh, but standalone non-club management facilities are rare. There are fewer than five facilities in Texas with that 12 or more courts, Round Rock being one of those facilities that, that Ryan mentioned earlier. And then larger facilities with over 12 courts are, more, are not necessarily feasible unless there's constant programming to fill them, so that weekly, vis weekly visitation. And then for volleyball, eight courts is a solid size for a facility, uh, with six courts being ideal for smaller events. And then I'm gonna move on to some potential case studies. So when we look at a facility that we, that we wanna recommend, we look at case studies, and we'll get more into depth with this when we have actual recommendations. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of facilities that are both indoor, outdoor, because again, we don't have our recommendations yet. So we like to look at places for inspiration. Um, so Sand, Ma Sand Mountain Park, the complex, um, which is located in Alabama. You can, I hope you guys can, can see these photos. So you can see there's a mix of the indoor and outdoor with the nine turf diamonds, uh, five multi-purpose fields. They have four basketball courts as well as a competition pool inside. And then Rocky Top Sports World, it's located in Tennessee has 10 basketball courts, uh, five turf fields, and then one natural field. And then TBK Bank Sports Complex, located in Iowa, has eight basketball courts, an indoor field, and then 10 light lighted turf diamonds, and two multi-purpose turf fields. So as you as you can imagine, these, these facilities drive um, a lot of sports tourism. And in the broader, uh, presentation will go into more more detail on that visitation and where people are coming from um, and the and, and things like that yeah and I, I think that just as, as we wrap up on the case studies here of, of course we want to be cognizant of, of facilities that are similar to what we recommend but also markets as well I mean you're a, certainly a very unique situation with the level of growth that you've experienced in the past and are going to continue to experience so we want to make sure that not only the ones that we're studying and, and hearing more from are not just similar in a programmatic sense, but also similar in terms of where you're at in your, in your growth stage as a city. So um, again, we've got a lot more coming in two weeks, but wanted to just highlight some of the local, the regional, and some of the conversations that we've had in terms of the research. Um, but happy to take any questions um, at this point, and, and we'll continue to, to keep going on, on the deck. Yeah, Ryan, my first question is out of those, the last slide you just showed with all the different ones in the different areas, about approximately what size are the, yeah, that, that slide right there, approximately what size are these uh, particular facilities? 
Yeah, in terms of uh, the total acreage, right. um, I, I don't know that off the top of my head, but we can certainly do some quick measurements online and just provide, provide you guys in a follow-up email just the overall acreage that they take up. You know, again, typically for a, a full-size turf soccer field, you're looking anywhere between three to five acres. And then on the uh, indoor complex, if you're talking roughly 100 to 125,000 square foot indoor facility it's typically in that 15 to 25 acre range but what we can do is we can follow up um, with you guys in a quick email and just overview these sites on google and provide you just some feedback on, on the acreage okay can you also send us uh, or send sylvia a copy of this slide deck here that you can disseminate yeah. to the rest of you us? have it already you already got it great thank you absolutely oh good it, fi it finally went through yes after all that okay i'm glad and the board does have it already. Okay. Okay, wonderful. I emailed it to you, and it's in your shared file, file yeah, as well. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah, okay. but it is 24 megs, so it may take a minute to sync. No, that, <laughs> that's all right. I just want to make sure so we can actually actually go through it. Uh, you know, uh, I know it's the initial one, but we're all excited to hear as much as we can about this particular project. And so the more information we have, the better prepared we can be for the next time we meet on December the 3rd. And uh, that, that's, you know, that's where I'd like for us to be. Any yeah, questions? It, and if I just do want to add to, you know, one of the things that we're focused on is trying to track down as many of these conversations as possible. You know, one thing that's getting really difficult specifically in Texas is the continual development of these facilities. So we just want to make sure that we have a good sense of the level of demand and really the feasibility in terms of bringing the level of events that that we, we feel comfortable projecting here. So that's really going to be the main focus because we, we feel like we've, we've done a good job in identifying the relevant competition. Now we just wanna make sure that we're speaking with the experts that are routing these events um, through the region so that we can be sure and be confident in terms of the overall recommendations that we'll provide. So it's gonna be a busy two weeks, but again, we feel like we're in a good spot and just wanna make sure that if you guys have any questions or, or any comments over the next two weeks um, that we're working through them. So feel free to reach out with any questions or, or any issues that you have with the deck that, that was just sent over today. Great, thank you. Perfect, the, you kind of answered my question. I was go going to say, will you be speaking with more of the sports tourism stakeholders like uh, one that's noticeably absent for me would be U-Triple-S-A baseball, because that's probably the biggest one that I know of baseball-wise. But I think you kind of answered that question. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, apologies. That's certainly not an exhaustive list. Um, we've, we've chatted with them in multiple regions just this year alone. So we'll make sure that you triple essays on the list. You know, we've also worked through other, other lists like perfect game, um, and, and those larger, more national, uh, baseball operators. So, um, again, just want to highlight that that's certainly not an exhaustive list, but thank you for bringing it up uh, just as an example. Great. And Ryan, one quick question that I had is, um, you guys have obviously looked at existing facilities in the region and across Texas. Do you guys also look at facilities that will be coming online? Like maybe they're in early phases or they're, you know, pre-development and, but they will have facilities that may compete with, you know, the Bastrop area. Yeah, always important to be cognizant of that. Um, we can certainly include its own section in terms of in the pipeline and, and under construction because those will have an effect on, on our financial projections. Um, and if, if, for example, there's something coming up between Bastrop and Austin that we need to be aware of, even if it's just a handful of fields or a smaller indoor facility, um, it, it will be important to make sure that we do that. Yep. A um, couple of questions. So one is, how would you describe your top level success metrics? for determining that this project is feasible moving forward? Yeah, I think it, it relates back to the overall goal of, of why we're here, and that's really to drive sports tourism. So I would say number one for this project is when we get into the demand and financials, making sure that the recommendations are driving ample room nights to the project and net new taxes from visitors coming into the city and spending their money. 
um, in your city to drive that economic development. But of course, again, I, I said it before, but there's always a sliding scale of importance to long-term feasibility for these. And it's important, no matter the intent of the project or the size of the project, that um, local utilization be emphasized just as much as regional utilization, making sure that there's enough programming in the local market to support the ongoing operations of a facility, making sure that there's not, they're mitigating uh, any losses at all possible from operations in a facility like this and making sure that it's accomplishing its goal of, of driving room nights on the weekend. So I would say in terms of this project, knowing the nature of it is, is rooted in economic development, that we want to make sure that it would be filling a gap in the market for additional regional events, um, but certainly more than just one, uh, one purpose of, of driving room nights, but making sure that it's sustainable both locally and regionally. Now, you're... In your plans or your expectations for this, this would be run by a third-party independent operator, correct? I apologize. Can you, could you repeat that? I didn't hear the question. Yeah, so um, this would be run by a third-party independent operator. And so yes. The, yes. Uh, the activities would need to be profitable for them or else we wouldn't have anyone to run it. So it seems like that's a primary success metric as well. Well, let's course, also keep in mind that nine uh, stability is, is certainly important. Typically, those operators are um, taking management fees of the project, so they're getting compensated through a, either a monthly or an annual management fee. But of course, it, it is their job to make sure that they're programming the facility um, with the specifications or with the, the promises that they have in terms of number of events that they're bringing to the facility. Um, but of course, their financial success and being able to, to generate a profit in the building is, is important as well. Who's going in this model, who's going to pay the electric, the electric bill and mow the lawns and pay for all of the maintenance and upkeep of it? Let me try to help before we get into all that because we don't know the answers to that and neither do they because this is going to be purchased by a or, or leased, whatever, by a developer. The developer may or may not be the operator. So we really don't know who the operator is going to be or what their methodology is going to be. But, I mean, so... We're, but, we're, but the reason why I don't care about uh, that is because... There's going to be a fixed number of maintenance things that are going to be done that we could brainstorm on and come up with a list, and we know electricity and, and the lawn is, is on that. And someone's going to have to pay for that, and we're going to have to generate enough revenue from the activities there in order for that to be paid for, or else the entity that is supposed to be paying for it isn't going to have enough money and the business will collapse and fail. Right. I, I understand the thesis yeah. of it. It's that we're, the city's not going to operate it, we're not going to operate it, right. and whoever wants to come in and do it obviously is going to have to have the wherewithal and the expertise and the experience to know that, yes, this is going to make money, otherwise they're not going to bid on it, they're not going to want to do it. No, I agree, but that's what I'm saying is that as a primary success metric, the viability of it as a business for someone to operate it is important. Of course. You know, because certainly if we bring in um, more hotel occupancy taxes to the city, that's a good thing. You know, that's a, that's a check mark. But if the thing fails as a business right. uh, without the city giving additional funds to it to prop it up, well, then you, you haven't met. I guess I'm saying that, that part of the goal, I think, is that uh, this must be um, a viable self-sustaining you know, self -sustaining thing <laughs> right. that doesn't require general fund money for it to, right. to operate. And, and nowhere at any time have we ever contemplated that. It's a good question. Yeah. And, and we need to make sure that yeah. we do pick the right folks when we go through the request for qualifications. When we hear the qualifications of the developers that are ultimately going to be developing this and bidding on this, those are exactly the kind of questions that we need to ask them to make sure, as you said, that they are qualified, they have the wherewithal to do that. Otherwise, it's, it's not, if they're not self-sustaining, why would we even want to choose them in the first place? And, Let and me ask it this way. Um, Ryan, would you say that it's typical for a third-party operator to take on maintenance of the facility? No, it's typically the, the way that they're, it, they're brought in to do exactly the mitigation of that, those expenses and those costs. So it's, it's typical that they would be 
uh, we'll say the leasing the facility in terms of operations and hired to manage the facility in the best way possible. Um, their income is gonna come off of the management fee and it's their job as the operator to run it as efficiently as possible. So making sure that the utilities and the maintenance and the wages and benefits are under control and, and as low as possible to uh, really support the ongoing operations of the facility. But again, that's typically why they're hired because of their experience in operating the facilities and making sure that they are sustainable long term from a financial perspective. Um, maybe I can maybe I can clarify. The overall goal is for, the not, for this not to be a BEDC or city-owned facility. We're looking for a public-private partnership because the BEDC owns the underlying land. And the overall facility, and I'll, I will say it probably till I'm blue in the face on my deathbed, cities don't do well operating these types of facilities. We don't ever usually have the expertise in-house to do that. So it's always necessary to come up with a um, management partner, if you will, or whatever you want to call that operational partner. So I think to uh, Board Chair Kirkland's point, yes, there are going to be fees that are going to be required. In the models that I have worked before, there is a subsidy that is provided for said period of time, either by the city, by the EDC, or some combination thereof, who's ever in the agreement in the partnership role. Those fees encompass everything that you just asked for, and they also, um, whoever bids on the project, whoever's taking it over, takes those things into account so that we make sure it's covered. The fallback position, if a management company goes out of business or the developer goes bankrupt, those kinds of things, depending on where we are with the leasehold, if we're, if we're holding the underlying land, then reverts back to us. If not, because we've sold it and the only thing remaining is an agreement, then things go a very different way. Yeah. Uh, the last thing uh, is when you do turn in the final reports, please show your work on the models, uh, you know, estimated. Uh, numbers of events, the the price per unit that you're leasing to those entities, like you know, price per field or price per whatever, so that we can do all the math with you and see how it comes up to being uh, financially, you know, viable or not. Yeah, absolutely. That will the uh, financial pro formas will have uh, all those assumptions shown um, all the way down to the line items of the expenses that we were discussing. So. Revenues and expenses and the assumptions for events um, and overall impact, those will all be included within the, within the financial projections. And, and I want to tie that to one of the thoughts I had during the presentation. There was uh, a mention of volleyball fields or volleyball courts uh, not being common in uh, medium and smaller cities because it was impractical to use them five days a week with local traffic. Um, the uh, uh, so, so that's the sort of thing that I think that we could look at in terms of uh, the, the model says that in order for this entity to be profitable, uh, running a business of this kind, it's going to show usage of X, Y, and Z, you know, local traffic, uh, regional traffic, and how many events are going to be there. And if you look at it and you say, well, goodness, I don't see how our community could sustain something like that, or I don't see how we would have enough hotels uh, to sustain the number of people that would need to come in for that. You know, it kind of allows us to use our just existing knowledge of our city to, uh, you know, cross-check the, the model, so. Absolutely, fine. yep, no, that, that makes total sense. Any further questions? Well, thank you very much. That's uh, very informative for the, the first, the initial uh, update on what you guys have been uh, working on and who you've talked to. It's some really good progress, like you had said earlier. And I know all of us are looking forward to the uh, December 3rd meeting uh, to hear more updates on this. Will so, you guys be in person on December the 3rd? I believe that the 3rd is supposed to be a virtual presentation. Um, but I can certainly work with, with Greg and the team on getting uh, the other presentations to be in person for the demand and financials or um, any presentations that follow that to be there in person. Okay. If it's virtual, it will be in a similar format, so practice up on your go-to 
Um, but it'll be a much larger, we may have to have it at the convention center, which will have a different acoustic and um, screen sharing. So if you have a presentation beforehand, please send that so we can share that. Absolutely, that sounds good. Great. All right, well, right thank you guys very happy. much. Really appreciate everything you've, you've done so far. Thank you very much, Greg. What, what was that? I was just going to add that right now, I think we've got December 3rd for 5.30 p.m. Is that correct? Yeah, I yes. see that on, on the calendar is 5.30 to 6.30 on the 3rd. Very good. Okay, thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all. Have a good night. Good night. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Good deal. Okay. Well, let's see here. Uh, I guess we can move on to 6F, which would be consideration and possible action approving resolution R 2024-0010, suspending the sale of property in the Bastrop Business Industrial Park until Hunton Partners has completed the feasibility study for the sports complex. Sylvia? Um, so there are uh, several pieces of property that are currently vacant in the business park. What Hunden has requested is that we suspend accepting offers until at such point the feasibility study is done. Obviously, that takes board action. We do have um, businesses who inquire on a, a daily basis. And so I think at a minimum, the area of the sports complex outline should be um, taken off the table until January or after your December 3rd meeting. Um, I hate to ask the question why, because you just told us why, but uh, the board has to take action to sell anything. So why, what's the, what, what's the value of doing this versus say doing nothing, not doing this and then just not approving anything? Well, for lack of a better idea, or term if I'm presented with a great offer and I just don't bring it to you one of you inevitably will bring up why I didn't bring it up so I need well, the board to be completely aware of what we're doing not not only that but we actually have one pending now mm -hmm. that we will talk about mm -hmm. a little bit later uh, so to me it would be more like just a, a, an announcement so to speak mm -hmm. that for anybody else that is coming to us would be under the knowledge that we've passed a resolution to hold off uh, of any sales until after we have uh, more clarity in this feasibility study. No, I don't object to the, the goal. I was just curious, you know, what, yeah. I, this wasn't clear to me, like, why do we have to do this when nothing can move forward if we don't allow it to? Yeah. Like, you sort of implicitly get that if that's what the you, board wants. You do. I, I guess and if I, the board I, changes its mind, it can change its mind. So, right. right. You know. I guess, like I say, the only thing I, I would, that would directly address it is because we have one pending that we need to, to make it. We need to inform them, basically. Okay. So, all right. Well, then, I guess uh, looking for a motion to, um, to accept or approve resolution R2024-0010. Motion to approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All right, the motion carries. Very good. Okay, I believe we're finished with section six. We will now move into section seven, executive session. Uh, 7.A, the Bastrop EDC Board of Directors will meet in a closed executive session pursuant to the Texas Government Code, chapter 551, to discuss the following. Number one, section 551.071, consultation with attorney regarding the termination of performance agreement with Project Fiesta, a.k.a. Colson LLC. Number two, section 551.087, economic development negotiations to deliberate offer of financial incentives to BRP East LP. Number three, section 551.972, Deliberation regarding real property west of Jackson Street and south of South Street. Uh, and the time now is 6.49 p.m. We're moving into executive session. All right, it is now 7.29 p.m. on Monday, November the 18th. Um, 
The Bastrop EDC Board of Directors will reconvene into open session to discuss, consider, and or take any action necessary related to the executive sessions noted herein. There are no actions. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Aye. We have been adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>